Oh, thank you very much for having me and, uh, and for taking time to come and listen to what I have to say. I'm a digital humanities, or a digital humanist by default. Um, I'm really a professor of literature and spent a lot of time working on poetry and literary biography, but the Canterbury earthquakes have changed many people's lives and, and mine included. Um, prior to this, the only really major digital humanities project I'd been involved in was the uh, New Zealand Electronic Tech Centre, which we set up back in 2001, um, and it's still going strong. That's at nzetc.org.nz, uh, .nz, I think, and uh, that's a, a full text archive that we're, we're, we're enlarging, and um, it mainly deals with New Zealand historical and literary texts. Uh, and it's become a go-to resource for particularly 19th century studies. Um, I just heard not too long ago about the earthquake in Italy and that reminded me that one of our lecturers in Italian at uh, University of Canterbury had told me that Italians have a word for people who've been earthquaked. They're known as the Terimotati, uh, which apparently is a special social category in Italy which means you're immediately aided you're soon victims of corruption. You slowly, you're slowly turned into an object of resentment because everybody has to bear the weight of reconstruction. And finally, you're left on your own, forgotten, possibly in prefabs for the time being, which actually um, comes very close to our experiences in Canterbury. <laughs> we didn't realise that we lived on an earthquake zone. We have fault lines buried deeply beneath um, hundreds of metres of very rich silt, which comprises the fertile and abundant Canterbury Plains. And so when a quake shook our homes on the 4th of September in 2010, um, it shook our complacency as well. We'd always assumed that our city of Wellington, which sits on the main fault line, would be the one to get devastated and uh, we'd be quite safe down in the South Island. Uh, until the Greendale Fault opened up underneath us, no one knew it existed, and since then the um, quake sequence has been rumbling along. Um, we know a lot about earthquake sequences now. We know that aftershocks can in fact go on for years, and uh, we still have 80% um, probabilities that an earthquake of five or above is going to um, visit us at some stage in the possibly near future. In fact, um, just the other night, a 4.8 quake shook Christchurch very near where uh, my wife and children are envying my trip to, to, uh, to England. Um, in September, we thought we dodged a bullet. Um, miraculously, no one was killed. The injuries were, were very few. We spoke proudly of our first world infrastructure and our quake-proof buildings um, because we knew what a similar-sized earthquake had done to, in Haiti. Uh, and then, uh, 22nd of February 2011 happened and it was a huge aftershock. It was right under our city centre. It had one of the highest peak ground acceleration rates ever recorded. Lives were lost, around about 190 directly and quite a few indirectly and injuries were terrible. Um, the thing we didn't realise was that uh, the quakes were going to keep going. Um, to, we're, we're now um, at 11,000 aftershocks and counting. And what you can see from this graphic is the way that um, they started at the Greendale Fault where the big star is, and then they've been moving towards the coast and they're currently moving out into uh, that big sweeping bay, Pegasus Bay. Um, and uh, the further out they go, the, the better, because that, that's the decay sequence. The 22nd of February quake... Um, destroyed 80% of Christchurch city centre, including Christchurch Cathedral. Um, 6,000 homes um, in areas that are prone to liquefaction have been red zoned and they'll be demolished. Um, the scale of it is, is um, hard to comprehend. Whole suburbs are going to be wiped out and uh, the Canterbury Earthquake Recovery Authority has an operational plan where they're waiting for the very first street to have all its residents sign off on the demolition orders and then they're just going to move in wholesale and we'll start to see streets disappear. Um, it's the third costliest insurance disaster in human um, in, in recorded history um, and as, I, as we came to understand it isn't over and the, re, the, the fact that it isn't over is what led to this project, the, the seismic project and I have to confess that seismic was originally an acronym and it does, 
it was going to stand for the Canterbury Earthquakes Images Stories of Media Integrated Collection, but try saying that five times and you'll realise why we've just now called it the Seismic Canterbury Earthquakes Digital Archive. We realised that the human toll and the human experience of this event was um, something that we needed to record. When the city is rebuilt, when the quake sequences have decayed to almost nothing, we're still going to be dealing with the impacts on people, on families and on communities. And they are the experiences that we wanted to record and preserve and make available, not just for our, our own people, the, the communities of Canterbury and the people in New Zealand, but for communities going through similar things um, around the world. A and also because we believe that there is important scholarship um, important research that needs to be undertaken and to do that there needs to be a primary resource. And I think Canterbury has some um, useful qualities that, that make this a, a, a potentially successful project. We're relatively first world as far as communities go. We've got high internet usage and digital uptake. Uh, so there's a lot of, a, a lot of records of the, the disaster around. We're, geographically interesting. We've got plains and we've got um, hills. Um, and the quakes hit across all strata of the community. So um, some of the wealthy hill suburbs have taken as much of an impact as some of the poor suburbs down on the, um, down on the flat. And so we began to develop the seismic program, which um, started in April 2011. Um, and it uh, began out of a sort of existential crisis for me when I um, was forced with my family to evacuate Christchurch and I ended up in Wellington where I was doing a bit of research and I'd watch the television at night and I'd see my colleagues in geoscience and engineering who sort of became, you know, local, local superstars really because they could explain what was happening and uh, help us understand it. Uh, and uh, for the first time I wasn't quite sure what use my literature degree was going to be to me. And I mentioned this to a friend, and he said, have you heard about this, the 9-11 uh, Digital Archive? And I hadn't, and I went and had a look. And um, of course, the Centre for History and New Media at George Mason University um, had, not too long after the September 11 attacks, began to collect stories and emails and other documents. Uh, and they'd eventually partnered with the Smithsonian and the Library of Congress. So I'll just flick back a minute. I've got a couple of other notes here. And um, we thought we could do something similar, uh, 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 and it was going to be a modest um, archive to begin with, a, a server under the desk, and we begin to collect um, material. And I'll tell you soon why it's grown to be something much larger. It now consists of three things. There's a consortium whose members are collaborating to develop a federated archive. Um, we've got a world-class digital repository which we are creating at the University of Canterbury to support research into the earthquakes impacts and recovery. And we've also got a physical presence on the ground in the form of a, a portable recording studio which we are deploying around our region to gather people's earthquake stories. And so what we wanted to do, our, our vision if you like, was to preserve people's collective experience, to create new knowledge out of the events, to participate proactively in recovery and to document the uh, rebuilding of communities and of our culture and of the infrastructure. And one of the things that I've found um, in the course of setting this project up is that universities are uniquely positioned. And the University of Canterbury was. We, have some very, very good um, technology. We've got um, one of the Southern Hemisphere's biggest supercomputers, uh, the Blue Fern. Um, we've got some um, well-integrated public institutions. Uh, New Zealand has a very coherent national digital strategy. We have Digital New Zealand, which creates um, search engines across um, heritage archives. We've got our National Digital Heritage Archive, which is um, set up for very long-term preservation. Um, we've got a number of other institutions as well. And because of these factors, we believed that we were uniquely positioned to collect and preserve and repurpose the digital record. Um, 
We also had another advantage, and this came home very clearly to me when we first launched our website, because um, one of the speakers there was the editor of the Christchurch Press, which is our major daily newspaper, Andrew Holden. Now, that's one of um, the Fairfax media stable. And um, the press had taken a terrible hit in the quake. Uh, their building had been seriously damaged. One of their staff had been killed. Uh, and they ended up out on the, the road um, deciding whether they'd get a newspaper out the next day or not. And they did, and they did it quite heroically. And that uh, newspaper of the 23rd of February is one of the things we'll have up on our site. And uh, Andrew Holden is very committed to making information available. And so at our launch, um, I, I'd said to him, look, just, just say whatever you like, how you intend to support us. And he got up and said that he intended to give everything to this archive to be freely available in perpetuity. Uh, and when he said everything, what he was talking about was a PDF of every page of every paper since the 4th of September. So not only would you know what had happened in um, the CTV building, but you'd be able to see what red zone people were selling in their garage sales once they had to move out of their condemned homes. So a major historical resource right there. And then there was um, the images, not just the 5,000 or so they've published, but the 15,000 that they haven't. And there's about 600 um, videos and a whole lot of other um, online material. Uh, of course, that's what he promised. When Fairfax's lawyers found out, I think one of them choked on a chicken bone and died. Um, <laughs> and we had some fairly robust negotiations with them around um, how we'd actually make this material available. But they have swung in behind it. And um, when our Quake Studies repository goes live in about five weeks, uh, we'll have a very large tranche of material from Fairfax Media, and it won't just be the Christchurch Press, but they've given us content from all of the regional newspapers as well. And we're starting with the, the, four, the four major days of the four big quakes, which were um, September and February I've talked about. There was one in June, and then there was one on the 23rd of December. And the reason he said later that he'd been prepared to give us this material was because he trusted the university to do the right thing with it. Now that's really reasonably impressive because the, the press spares nobody and in fact they've been having good hammer at us lately but they still trust us to take their material and, um, and preserve it and make it freely available. And I think that this has proved to me the value of what I consider to be a digital humanities approach because right from the start of this project we insisted upon collaboration and free access and open source and a federated archive over a centralised archive, and no profit whatsoever from anything in, in the archive. So if you're a researcher here or in Finland, um, you can access everything in our, in our earthquake repository um, in the same way that you would if you were back in Canterbury. The only things that we are subverting uh, is material that is currently uh, part of a research project that's underway or uh, material that has particular sensitivity. So, for example, we're going to be archiving um, a lot of images from uh, St John Ambulance, which, as you can imagine, are reasonably graphic, and they're going to be available to our health research teams, but, but nobody else. So we do have a lots of layers of um, subversion that we can apply to the, the, the uh, digital objects that we have, but unless there's a very compelling reason, we want them to be freely available to everybody. So we had reasonably modest beginnings, but the project is um, growing in all sorts of directions. We're looking at collecting digital objects via crowdsourcing, corpus creation, and data collection. We're enhancing our archive through targeted acquisitions and focused research. We're improving the quality of the digital objects through human metadata curation. And that's um, where we're being a little bit different, because uh, although we can do bulk ingest, we have the capacity to sit a student down with a digital object and take as long as they need to describe it and locate it and uh, contextualise it. Uh, just to give you an example, we, one of our Go Live collections is from Environment Canterbury. Now, they're responsible for all of the reports into soil stability. And they have 20 years' worth of historic soil stability reports and various other documents that they want to make publicly accessible, and they're going to do it through the Seismic Project. Um, but you know, when you have a report and it has 15 recommendations, sometimes only four or five of them are acted upon. And because we can um, manually curate this, we can sit down and ensure that there's an appropriate context wrapped around each object. 
And so um, my project manager, James Smithies, who we poached from, uh, he's, a his, he's a history PhD, but he's been doing big databases for our Ministry of Health for some years. Um, we poached him from there, and he's developed a very good ontology which allows us to describe an object in terms of the, the, the where it fits in the chronology of events. Uh, we can geolocate things, we can um, add sort, all sorts of other tags about the type of collection it is, um, people who might be in it and other events it might relate to and so on. Uh, and we believe that um, an archive that is curated to this degree has a lot of um, additional value. The more we can link it up and the more we can enrich it, uh, the more useful it's going to be to researchers. Um, and so we, will, uh, we want to facilitate study into disaster impact and recovery. Um, one of the big things for people of Canterbury and New Zealand is memorialising the people and the places that have been lost. Um, and when you get a sense of the, the structures that we have lost, um, a, a third of our Go Live collections is from our, the, the New Zealand Historic Places Trust. And one of the things that they did um, was to go into the central city and to record the deconstruction of all the heritage buildings, and there's hundreds of them coming down. And um, they've provided uh, very substantial reports that uh, give you the history of the building and show you the, the original plans and where it fitted into the early city, and then um, a description of who built it and its history, and then images of it being deconstructed. And then they've excavated two metres into every foundation, and so they have an exhaustive list of um, items found from you know bottles and bits of crockery to um, sort up oxen bones and I found run report where they'd also found one rat mandible so uh, they've gone to sort of quite considerable detail uh, as yet as far as I'm aware none of the reports have found human m remains um, uh, two meters under some of our old buildings we also um, are setting up at the University of Canterbury Australasia's first digital humanities program. We'll have a graduate teaching course, um, and I'll say a little bit more about that in a, in a few moments. What we want to do is to create and communicate new knowledge that we've gained from our experience. Now, I mentioned that uh, we're building a federated archive uh, with a consortium. One of the things that um, was very interesting after the quakes was that uh, government departments who have a responsibility uh, to collect information about a disaster like this were very twitchy about coming into Christchurch and taking over. So we had the National Library, uh, Te Papa, the Museum of New Zealand, uh, the Ministry for Culture and Heritage, um, needing to, to come and do their jobs, but being very aware of, this, of the local sensitivities. And when they found out that we were developing the, the seismic project, they very quickly jumped in behind it. And so we formed the UC Seismic Consortium. And I'll just tell you what some of the, the members are, are doing here. At the top left, you've got the Christchurch City Libraries. Now, they have a, a site called Kete, where they've been collecting people's images and so on since, the, since we first began. Uh, and what we, the way the consortium is working is that we've got some agreed metadata standards, and anyone can be a node in our federation as long as they can guarantee stable URLs and they can um, adopt the, these most basic metadata standards. And as long as they have those, then Digital New Zealand, who is building our search engine for us, can search across all of the nodes and surface them in one place. It's very easy to roll out. It works very well. It doesn't take a lot. Um, to add another node to the consortium. And so not only do we have um, collections being curated uh, by our consortium members, but we can add other um, small or large collections as well, as long as they are happy to, to add our metadata in. Sarah is the Canterbury Earthquakes Recovery Authority. They um, have legal power and authority to do pretty much anything they like. Uh, the head of Sarah, Roger Sutton, is sort of the earthquake czar. Um, they can override all, all sorts of normal planning regulations and people's objections. And they're charged with rebuilding Christchurch and uh, they've got a big city plan that uh, they're trying to finalise at the moment. And they're still busy um, working out the land zonings. There are, there are various lands. If you're red zone, your house is going to be bold and you've got no say in it. Um, if you're white zone, you're still waiting to be discovered whether you're going to be in a green zone or a red zone. And so there's a lot of uncertainty where we are. Now, Sarah uh, will probably cease to exist in five or six years, but they're very keen to make sure that 
their websites stay available and so we're in discussions with the moment about um, seismic being the long-term front window for for Sarah. The Canterbury Museum is doing um, historical preservation and, and um, uh, there's a, a um, what we're calling a virtual local heritage group and they're part of that and um, We've just recently succeeded in a funding bid with them to begin um, digitising some of their uh, particular collections. Naitahu is the South Island tribe. Uh, the North Island has a lot of tribes, the South Island really has one, and it's Naitahu. And um, we work very closely with them. The Naitahu Research Centre is part of our university, and uh, we've got a number of projects on the go, uh, looking particularly at Maori experience and how that uh, has um, been represented and how, how Maori have been affected. New Zealand on screen and the film archive are the two um, places that collect moving images, and um, we're in discussions with the film archive at the moment um, about uh, streaming. Uh, all of the earthquake coverage done by the free-to-air television channels which they have a, a legal mandate to collect. The National Library has their own collections. They've had a photographer in the red zone since 22nd of Feb and he's already collected 10 or 15,000 images and they'll all surface through seismic as well. Te Papa uh, Tongarewa is the Museum of New Zealand and uh, they also have their collection priorities. Archives New Zealand is required to, to collect all government and local government documents and um, and that includes digital objects but they don't have the resource to make them publicly available easily and so again we're in discussions with Archives New Zealand about uh, the seismic project possibly being the front window for access to their collection so in effect we'd be at the second depository and very soon we expect to begin um, collecting and making available the proceedings of the Canterbury Earthquakes Royal Commission, which has been going now for some months. Uh, the exhibits for the Canterbury Earthquakes Royal Commission are gold to um, engineers and geoscientists and health professionals and anyone interested in what's happening or what's happened with the quakes. As well as that, they have videoed all of their proceedings and they'll be available online as well. Um, the last one I should mention is the Ministry for Culture and Heritage and I'll just flick on because one of the first things the Ministry for Culture and Heritage did was to jump in and set up a little crowdsourcing website called quakestories.govt.nz and Quake Stories invites people to um, give their stories and um, also submit images. Now because the other, there's a lot of nodes that are doing crowdsourcing, that's something that we haven't had to worry about too much. And what we do, rather, if people come to us and say, we have material, we want it to be archived, we don't say, yes, give it all to us. We say, well, that's probably something you should, should take to Quake Stories, um, and they'll pop it into, as you can see there. Um, Quake Stories, is, is, it gets a little bit addictive. You, you get in and you start you know, getting caught up in people's stories, and some of them are quite remarkable. Um, some of them are quite remarkable just for the spelling and grammar, actually. But um, <laughs> I've been involved in several vehicle collisions, fallen off a cliff, been lost in the bush, but 22nd of February was the first time in my life I felt dread and feared for my life. And actually, that's probably just about the same for me. I remember sort of hiding under my desk while my office did a merry dance and feeling really annoyed that I might die today when I still had things I wanted to achieve. Um, one of the other nodes to our um, federation uh, isn't one of the consortium members, but it was a young man, a, a young in internet entrepreneur named Adam Stevenson, and he happened to hear that um, it was good therapy for people to be able to tell their stories if they'd been in a disaster. And so he set up this little website called When My Home Shook, and he invited children to um, submit stories to it. Uh, and he did, and they're extremely interesting. They're very nicely done. Some of them are... Um, you'll, you'll hear about them all learning to make their turtle and what that means is you've got to hunker up down on the floor as if you're a turtle and uh, I think there was one who memorably said that when the earthquake happened he thought the ground was farting. Um, and these are being, uh, these are also available through um, our, our website and this is where you can find it. This is seismic.org.nz. It's the, the front, pay, front end page for the, the seismic consortium and uh, it's just gone live with that little search box there, which has, as I said, been built 
for us by Digital New Zealand. And this has been a, a real source of pride to me. It shows that we did everything right from the start because we'd expected to create our own search engine. But we had very detailed requirements. We were very careful about getting our ontology right. And Digital New Zealand, which is an arm of our national library, came to us and offered to build a search engine for us. Um, and they uh, can search across all of the earthquake archives. It's just gone live. Currently, there's about 12,000 digital objects that you can find. Um, by this time next year, I hope there's at least 120,000. Um, and and uh, this is what you'll get. The brief was reasonably simple. We just wanted it to you know, be Google-like, so it was relatively intuitive for most people. Um, this, is a, this is if you typed in the search CERA, which is the Canterbury Earthquake Recovery Authority, and you'll get images, and the first image on the left is Roger Sutton, who's the, the CEO. And um, if you hit the cascading, hit the images box, it'll cascade down, and you'll find various other images. And then you can go further on in and focus in on one image. And um, down the side there, you can see very basic metadata at the moment, but we can add a whole lot more material and a whole, whole lot more content if we want to. And um, because everyone else was doing crowdsourcing, we had the um, luxury, if you like, to, con to, to concentrate on what we call UC Quake Studies, which is our own very high-spec research repository. And at the moment, if you go to the Quake Studies site, you'll find a curtain there. Um, we're reasonably pleased with what we've been able to do on our budget. Um, we've got a, a, a high-spec fedora bucket. It's got a Drupal front end, and we've got a good bit of IP tied up in the way that those two talk to each other. And um, our ontology has proved itself because Sarah has um, offered to, has said rather than develop their own, they'll probably take ours on. So, you know, that's quite good. Um, and what you can see down the bottom are um, partner collections for our go live. So I mentioned Environment Canterbury and the Christchurch Press and uh, the New Zealand Historic Places Trust. And soon after that, I think we'll have the Canterbury Earthquakes Recovery Authority and um, some more large image collections. And when we lift the curtain, um, this is what you're going to find. Um, something that we hope will be a, 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 an important asset for New Zealand's national cultural heritage infrastructure. We expect it to fa facilitate research into disaster impact and recovery. Um, it can scale up to uh, around 100 terabytes and around 13 million digital objects. Um, and it's the university's node in the federated archive. And as I said, most of it will be freely accessible. You'll find it um, full of material that's carefully preserved and um, almost all open access. And we've got a project office set up, which is also part of our digital humanities program. And um, we, all of this is, is, is done by students. So we uh, are using it as a teaching resource as well. And here's one little interesting sideline. This is the, um, we have a, a HIT lab, a human interface technology lab at um, the University of Canterbury. And they've been developing a, a little Android app called City View AR. And what that allows you to do is, um, if you're geolocated, then you can look at an empty site and see what used to be there. And so um, they um, can show you the building, and what Seismic is doing is providing the content. So we've got students working at the moment, um, adding all sorts of information about um, the, the buildings that are there. And we're also doing something interview interesting with City View AR. We've, um, developing a relationship with uh, the Central Otago um, Tourism Association who are interested in using this as a, a, a way to guide people around tourist sites, the old gold fields, villages and those sorts of things where all you'll find at the moment are a few old chimneys and um, you know, a few bricks and, and some mine shafts and things but um, we can actually virtually rebuild the, the, um, the settlements there and populate those with information and with a, a little local server uh, it should be quite easy for people to go in, download the app, and then walk around the site and see what used to be there and find out all about it. So that's another little thing under development. As I said, um, uh, we're student-based and student-focused. This is Lucy Jane Walsh. She was actually here last year. She was one of our students who was evacuated during the quakes and ended up coming to Oxford for a, a term and, and working over here. Um, she's now being trained as a business analyst. 
so far we've um, taken almost a dozen of our humanity students and put them in jobs in various places um, working with the earthquake. We've got two of them working as information analysts with the Canterbury Earthquakes Royal Commission. We've had half a dozen working in our project office and, um, and we've sent quite a few as interns to our partner organisations to help them improve their metadata. And um, the other thing that I mentioned we have is a, a little physical um, presence in the form of a portable recording studio, which we call the Quake Box. And this is a collaboration with our uh, internationally significant New Zealand Institute of Language, Brain and Behaviour. And what the NZILBB does is that they do very high-spec recordings of people um, and then analyse voice and gesture. And this fits in with our um, commitment to repurposing information. So they will, we'll take the quake box out, we get people's quake stories, we do them, we record them in high definition, the NZILBB uses that for their particular analysis, and the transcripts of those interviews and sometimes interviews themselves go into the seismic archive so that um, researchers can search across them for information. And uh, it really brought home to me how important the university is in terms of reaching out, because when we deployed the quake box, you can see it just down there on the right. Uh, this is the restart mall. This is a mall, a casual mall, which was um, pretty much completely destroyed during the 22nd of Feb quake, and quite a few pe people died there. And it's been um, reconstituted as a mall made out of shipping containers. And uh, they've done a beautiful job, and uh, it's, a, uh, it's a great place to go and visit. And we've put the um, portable recording studio in there and there was a bit of publicity about it and people have travelled from satellite towns even to get into town to give their story to the university and it's made us realise how important it is that the university get out into the community because people trust us to look after their material and do the right thing with it. Um, the quake box soon hopefully is going to head into the eastern suburbs, the area where the homes are going to be demolished and spend 30 weeks going around um, suburban malls and schools and again collecting we hope about 6,000 um, quake stories that we'll be able to um, put into the archive. And very quickly, I'll just sign off by um, mentioning that James Smithies, who uh, set up this uh, as my uh, project manager, uh, is about to become New Zealand's first digital humanities uh, senior lecturer. And um, he has developed a, a, a set of courses at graduate level that we've sent to about 20 or 30 people around the world for review and have received almost uniformly positive feedback. And what we're trying to do um, is to uh, get our um, humanities students actively um, engaged in sort of digital practice in, in the workplace. And, um, and these are some of our aims. Uh, and we know this is possible because we've already done it. We've, we've been sending students who can um, read critically and write well and have some computer skills into the workplace and finding that they are a really valuable interface between, say, management and, and the techies. And so um, James has developed a number of courses and he's got something up online. If anyone's interested, I'm happy to, to, to send you the URL or, or even um, the course outlines. Uh, he's got one on the digital modern and, um, and we're also working closely with our computer scientists and our computer graphics and image processing um, uh, lab to uh, develop a, a sort of a, a, a series of courses that cross over disciplines, if you like. That's about all I have to say. Um, I hadn't intended to go quite so long. I was going to open it up for discussion and feedback and any thoughts or comments you might have.